Some viewers may find this disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi, my loves. It's Destin Choice, and you're watching Choice TV. So today I want to get on here and speak about Steven Tyler, the alleged pedophile. Now, I wanted to get on here and speak on Steven Tyler because, as you guys know, I did a video about Trey Songs addressing all his problematic things that he's done to women and women in the industry. Many of y'all went down a deep rabbit hole and requested me to do a video on several people. Some of you guys asked me to do a video on Will Smith, Birdman, David Bowie, Marilyn Manson, Tyga, Drake, and many more. But of course, I wanted to go down the rabbit hole and speak on Steven Tyler because it seems like people never talk about him. Steven Tyler even recently won an Emmy and he was heavily honored at several award shows. But isn't it interesting how people always seem to forget that he groomed, had sex with, and forced a 16 year old girl to get an abortion? Isn't it interesting how people never bring that shit up? But for some reason, people went way back in Bill Cosby's past and held them accountable for all the stuff he did back in 1874. Now, before I get started with this video, I do want to say that parents watching this, Please do everything you can to protect your children. Children are the most unprotected people in society. Now, I do find it interesting how there's a massive calculator for all the COVID cases, but there's never a massive calculator for all the missing children, all the children who have been abused, groomed, or mistreated, or traumatized. Kids operate at the highest frequencies and the highest energy, and there's a lot of evil, nasty, and salacious people out there who are doing everything they can to absorb and suck them dry of their innocent energy. Now, of course, I don't want to waste any more time, and I want to get right into this video and address the legendary Steve. Steven Tyler. Steven Tyler is one of the most infamous and notable acts to ever come out of the music industry. Steven Victor Tallarico was born on March 26, 1948. He's better known by his stage name, Steven Tyler. Steven Tyler, as we all know, is an American singer, musician, actor, voiceover actor, and former television personality whom we all know for hosting American Idol. He is best known as the lead singer of the Boston-based rock band, Aerosmith. The band Aerosmith came up around the era of the Beatles, Jackson 5, and Elton John. Their imprint in the music industry completely pivoted pop music and paved the way for heavy metal rock music, and Aerosmith completely took over the 70s and the 80s decade. If it weren't for Aerosmith, the crazy hairstyles, leather jackets, and theatrical makeup wouldn't even exist in our music culture today. Steven Tyler really was the Beyonce of the entire group. He caught the eye of the masses, and with his vocal range and powerful jaw-dropping style, he caught people's attention all over the world. Steven Tyler was absolutely everywhere by the 1970s, and everybody celebrated him. And with that kind of success, comes with a lot of power and influence. And as we all know, that's a recipe for disaster, especially considering all the evil things some of these musicians are completely tied to. Now, unfortunately, I really hate to say it, but the 1970s and 1980s was the complete era of pedophilia. It was completely rampant back then because back then, no one really talked about it. It was more so in your face, but people didn't really talk about it because it was completely normalized. Thanks to rock stars and musicians in the 20th century, the term groupie became a massive staple in pop culture. Back in the days, the young women that went crazy over these rock bands were referred to as baby groupies, and they often were celebrated in tabloids and in the media because of their association with rock stars. I put him on this big pedestal. I said, I was so in love with you, Robert. And he said, I was in love with you too. Jimmy goes, why don't you come over to my room? I'll show you something. <laughs> oh my God, I hit the jackpot again. And us groupie girls were their goddesses. Groupies, they like to be involved with what the band's doing. I mean, I like them, you know. We all understood each other. We were all one. Together, we put the sex in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Wait, I'm not giving Jimmy Hendrix head with his relatives. Oh, he in Seattle. He took me into the toilet, you know. Into the toilet. Yeah, that was the only place available. God. He tried. He He's did famous that, for uh, that. He does that to in his everybody. musician's room. He did right. that to me too. <laughs> uh, he said, "Baby, I'd like to make love to you," and he just took me in this room, and just you know, I said, "What?" <laughs> I didn't know he meant right then on the spot. Oh, you bought Jeff Bay. I would hope that we have passed all that. I would say sure, but I don't believe in sex before marriage. The goal was to marry one. Of course, that was the goal. And I didn't just go these guys to them. I wanted to have a relationship. I wanted to get some meaning out of it. I wanted to uh, see why, what drew me to them. But not every groupie wants marriage or even a permanent relationship. If I would have continued to fall in love with guys and bands, I probably wouldn't have been as popular as I am. I also think it's fair to point out the obvious that most of these groupies were all minors. They were all young women. Now, I find it funny how MTV gave a whole segment and a whole documentary to these rock stars who had all these groupies 
and praise these rock stars for having all these groupies. Meanwhile, MTV was one of the first networks and platforms to condemn R. Kelly, stop supporting R. Kelly, and they even gave Surviving R. Kelly the documentary a whole MTV award last year. Isn't that interesting how rock stars get uplifted, but people like R. Kelly get condemned? Let's keep the same energy. These baby groupies would be recruited behind the scenes by managers, assistants, and creeps that would oftentimes offer them food, shelter, and an opportunity to go backstage and meet these artists. And let's just say things like that still exist to this day. And that's what leads me to Julia Holcomb. Julia Holcomb, also known as Julia, is Steven Tyler's ex-fiance, whom he started sleeping with when she was only 15 years old and he was 25. Julia Holcomb was born on 1958 and raised in Portland, Oregon to a single mother. Julia has said on numerous occasions that her mother was incredibly abusive and neglectful, and it played a huge role in her self-esteem. Julia sadly never felt loved growing up because she dealt with a mother who oftentimes ignored her, neglected her, and mistreated her, and she also had a father that was never in her life. So at a young age, Julia started messing around with the wrong crowd to feel seen and respected. In 1973, when Julia was only 15 years old, she met a girl from around the area who was 24 years old at the time who was heavily involved in the groupie and rock scene. But Stephen and I met when I was just a very young girl. I, I had met a young woman who had access to backstage parties in Portland, Oregon. She knew one of the promoters and she would groom girls to take backstage to be uh, entertaining to the rock stars. And she would give them a kind of a carrot of you can marry a rock star. And when you're 16 or I met her when I was 15, mm -hmm. she wouldn't let me go to the concerts till after my 16th birthday. My birthday was October 1st. And I met Stephen in November. It was my very first concert. And he wasn't the headline band. They were just mm -hmm. the opening group. This was his first uh, kind of their, one of their first major tours. And, but I had heard the song dream on and I had seen Stephen's picture on an album, and I had just become, you know, mesmerized with him. Like he was my idol. I mm -hmm. idolized him. And I can remember going to the concert, watching the show, and then my friend kind of pulling me by the arm to the backstage door. And I walked through those the concert hall hallways back to where the band was, and I met Stephen. And it was just we just kind of locked eyes and. I ended up going back to his hotel with him that night. I didn't go home. And, you know, our family had gone through a kind of a crisis. My mother was going through a divorce and nobody asked where I was. Nobody really was there, even though I was so young, to check up on me just to find out, you know, where was she? Why didn't she come home? Right. And mm -hmm. the next day, Stephen sent me home in a taxi. He said, look, I want to take you with me to Seattle. And uh, you go home, uh, I'll get you a ticket at the airport and you get your stuff and I'll meet you at the at the concert in Seattle. And I, I can remember going home and just telling my mom what had happened and that Stephen wanted me to to go to Seattle with him. And, you know, she was OK with it. Did anybody say anything or act like it was unusual for a grown man to have a child as a date? Well, this was something that was not completely unique in the world that I lived in with Stephen. Sure. There were other rock singers who had underage girls that were certainly under the age, you know, of consent. And mm -hmm. they were there not as, um, you know, not as a ward, but as an intimate lover. But it wasn't until a few months of Steven Tyler and Julia seeing each other that he later demanded that she be let go and he become her legal guardian. Well, I went to Seattle and then I went home and I was still uh, in school for that portion of the year. Steven called me. He was working on an album and he had written a song for me and he sang it to me over the phone. And then he would just call and we would talk for hours. And then he asked me if I would fly out to Boston and spend uh like that summer. And I thought I would come for a few weeks. But once I got there for a few weeks, he wanted me to stay for the entire summer. He took me up to New Hampshire. He sat me down and he said that he wanted to become my legal guardian and that he wanted to take me on tour with him. And to me, that sounded like excitement. Now, I can remember him explaining to me I was too we, I was too young for us to get married. That was the way he framed it. Mm -hmm. He said, "I can't marry you because of your age." 
until you're older, but I could become your legal guardian and take you on the road. Otherwise, I can't take you ac- across state lines without being arrested. And I can remember not really understanding everything that he was saying, but I, I can, I could understand that it was, he wasn't asking me to marry him. And I told him I didn't think my mom would sign the papers. And I felt a little vulnerable, but Mm -hmm. also hopeful that I would get to go on tour. That was pretty much all I could think about was, Mm -hmm. oh, I'll get to go on tour. However, this works out. And then he did come to me, you know, several months later, he had had his lawyers talk to my mother and she had said no at first, Mm -hmm. but he had convinced her that if I needed to go to the doctor, if I needed to go to school, that he would have to have these papers signed just for medical purposes. And he got her to sign them. And I can remember when he sat me down and said he had the papers and that he was my guardian. Uh, I can remember just thinking, I hope this all works out all right. I knew that I was in a much more vulnerable position than I had been before. That I was kind of at his... Once her mother surrendered full custody to her 15-year-old daughter, to a 25-year-old man, Julia then began moving her things into Stephen Tyler's Boston apartment, and they began dating seriously. After a few months of dating, Stephen then proposed the idea that he wanted Julia to bear his child because he wanted a family of his own. He then tossed her birth control pills over the balcony and showed her that he was full-on committed. I idolized him, and... Um... After we had been together for some months, he asked me if I was open to the idea of having a family, a child, and I was on the birth control pill at the time, but he said he wanted a family, and he wondered if I wanted a child. I said, yes, I did. I cared so much for him, and I loved children. So um, I told him, absolutely, I wanted a child. We were in a hotel, and he threw my birth control pills off the balcony. And um, within about a year, I became pregnant. I remember coming to him and telling him I was really excited. I wanted my baby so much, and I thought I couldn't wait to tell him. And he also seemed happy when I first told him that I was pregnant. And um, within a few months, he asked me to marry him. Throughout the year as they were dating, Julia eventually became pregnant at the age of 16 in 1974, and Stephen was overjoyed at first. After a few months of Julia's pregnancy, Stephen Tyler then became very abusive, and he refused to let Julia seek medical attention and attend doctor's appointments, and he also forced her to stay in the house all days at a time while he'd be out on the road. The reason why Julia was forced to stay in the house was because Stephen Tyler was afraid that if anyone found out that he got a 16-year-old girl pregnant, he would be in highly severe trouble. Stephen Tyler was then allegedly told by his team that the only way he can get away with impregnating a minor is if he married her in the state where it was legal. Because if y'all didn't know, Steven Tyler being her legal guardian gives him the right to marry her in the U.S. Despite all of Steven Tyler's team members being in his ear telling him not to marry her or not to have this child, he still stayed firm in his decisions. But it wasn't until Steven and Julia went on to go visit his family in New Hampshire that things started to spiral out of control. And I was going to have his baby and we were going to start a family. And he took me to New Hampshire where we had been before. His parents had a farm there that they had like a little resort. And um, we told his parents about our decision to get married, that I was expecting a baby. And their reaction was, um, not surprisingly, they expressed concern. I was very young and immature, and they were not as supportive as I had hoped. His mother was very supportive, but his father had grave reservations and was not shy about telling us what they were. Stephen asked his grandmother if he could give me her wedding ring to get married with, and she declined. She felt that if we divorced, the ring would leave the family. And uh, it was just a train wreck after that. On the way home, we argued just bitterly. I was so, I felt so vulnerable. I was expecting his baby and I was his ward. I really had very little say in what happened, but it seemed that he had a change of heart. He didn't want to get married any longer and I was very angry and I was not shy about telling him 
that I felt that he had really betrayed my trust. We returned to Boston and where we had our apartment and we were just kind of in limbo. I didn't really know how it was all going to work out. I just thought, well, well, I'll have the baby and we'll just live together. He left on tour and he decided to, to leave me there at the apartment because I was about five months pregnant. I don't know for sure how far along I was because I had not seen a doctor. Julia says he was never the same after his family rejected her and told him, we don't see this lasting. On top of that, Steven Tyler had a severe drug issue as he constantly was shooting up and plus he was experimenting with the worst kind of narcotics. And at the peak of the 1970s, the band Aerosmith was growing increasingly popular and as time went on, they were getting way and way and way more attention. And the band and Steven Tyler's team were becoming very fearful on rather or not this would ruin his reputation. But of course, Steven Tyler still wouldn't listen. As time went on and Julie became more and more pregnant, he still refused to let her go see medical attention and wouldn't even let her go see a sonogram. She had no idea what her baby was or if her baby was even healthy because Steven Tyler refused, again, to let her leave the house and seek medical attention. But it wasn't until Julia suffered a near-death experience that things started to completely crumble. I was, um, I had no education. I dropped out of high school. I didn't have a driver's license. I couldn't go anywhere. I had no money of my own and I had had no prenatal care. So I was in a, in a difficult position. He would call in the evening to check on me, but um, after about two weeks, the food in the apartment was running low, and I remember telling him, I need to go grocery shopping, and he said, well, I'll send someone over tomorrow. He was going to send Ray over, who was a former band member, and had helped with the band when they traveled. He said, I'll send Ray over, he'll take you grocery shopping tomorrow. So I was so excited because I had been cooped up in that apartment for two weeks and I was going to get to get out of the house. I, I sat there by the window just waiting for Ray to come. And he arrived, I let him in. And I don't remember what happened after that, but I woke up in a fire. Ray was gone and the apartment was on fire. There was smoke everywhere. I could not see anything but smoke. Um, I knew that I had to get out of there quickly because I couldn't breathe. I stood up and I tripped on the table. I fell to the floor and the smoke was less dense on the floor and I remembered um, some commercials that I had seen on TV, public service announcements about how to survive a fire and it said stay down on the floor because you can breathe better. I made my way to the front door and it was locked. There were three locks on that door. All three of them were locked and the bar lock was jammed. And I didn't, I just knew I had to immediately find another exit. So I made my way to the back stairway that led down into the kitchen area where there was another outside uh, exit. But when I got to the stairs, there were flames and smoke coming up the stairs. And when I reached out to grab the railing, it was so hot that I burned my hand on it. And I knew I was trapped. There was no way out of that house, that apartment. But I remembered in those commercials it said, if you're trapped in a fire, find a fireplace. And there was a clean, empty fireplace in our bedroom. I crawled into the fireplace. The flue was open. I, I lay there. I could, on the very bottom of the floor, there was air. And I could see smoke just churning and billowing up the fireplace flew and I was about to fall unconscious. I knew that I was going to die. And that's where the firemen found me. It was in that fireplace. They pulled me out and I woke up in the hospital. Julia does however have her suspicions on how the fire actually started, but police still to this day have no idea or what caused the fire. Despite Julia surviving the fire, Steven Tyler was far from empathetic. Julia was literally in the hospital for damn near two days. And as soon as she woke up in the hospital bed, Steven Tyler then greeted her. And one of the first things he said to her was that she had to get an abortion. Steven came to me and he said that I needed to have an abortion. That was where I was when he introduced the idea of my abortion. And I was just shocked. I couldn't imagine even thinking about having an abortion. I had thought I was going to get married and have a baby and start a family. And I was also, I remember telling him, how could you even ask me to consider this? I'm 
almost five months pregnant and I've just barely survived a fire. This is not fair. I shouldn't be asked to make such a, such a serious decision in, in a situation like this. And his words to me were that I had to have the abortion right now or the doctors wouldn't do it because I was so far along. He wanted me to have that abortion before I left the hospital. I just kept saying no until he placed the decision between him and the baby that I was going to have to go home uh, if, if I decided to keep my baby. I just couldn't imagine my life without him and I was so young I, I just really gave in at that point and that was where the, the worst ordeal began. Because I was so far along, I underwent a late-term abortion. They didn't explain it to me, they just wheeled me into a room. I was naked. <sighs> Stephen was there, and the doctor stood beside me, outside of my view, and he said, hold very still, or you could be killed or hurt. And I remember I just froze. I was terrified. I didn't understand what did he mean. I was about to ask him when he stabbed my stomach with a needle and I just gasped in shock and then they injected saline into my uterus to kill my baby and that was a partial that was a, a saline abortion so they took me into another room I had to labor so that my baby's dead body could be delivered or born. I was in labor for many hours and Stephen sat beside me snorting cocaine on the table beside my bed. At one point he offered me cocaine and I remember just turning away from him and just so sad and grieved inside at what was happening. I was in disbelief. I, I was in shock. I couldn't believe that this was happening. <sighs> After many hours the baby uh, was delivered and the nurse immediately took my baby away and I did not see what happened. Later when we were in New Hampshire Stephen told me that my baby was born alive and that it was a little boy I have read about uh, these late-term abortions since then, a saline abortion, and I've, I've read that it's not an uncommon thing that a baby would be born alive after a saline abortion, and that when the baby's born alive, at that time, they would kill the baby with, by either snipping the back of its neck or other methods strangling it. I don't know how they killed my baby, but Stephen knows. He saw what happened, and he told me about it. When, when he told me that, he was telling me that he was terrified, that he had a sense of dread and re regret over what he had done. He felt that God would punish him, and I was just in disbelief. I couldn't believe that it could be legal for them to just kill a baby that had survived an abortion. And I began to cry. Stephen tried to comfort me by telling me that I couldn't go back and do anything differently now, that the baby had died already, so that you know I should I shouldn't try to think about it. And he tried to comfort me by saying that we had done the right thing. And I remember being filled with anger because I knew that this was not the right thing to have done. It was wrong. And my baby was dead. I felt like I had been robbed of this precious life, this child, and I had personally been injured as well. And that I was made to cooperate with it by being put in the position of choosing between the baby or Stephen. I was so angry with myself for agreeing to it. I wished I could go back and change my decision and I couldn't. It was too late.
Considering that this was 1974, abortion still had a negative connotation attached to it because the right to abortion had just been legalized a year beforehand thanks to Roe versus Wade. After a few weeks, Julia suffered major depression and her and Steve's relationship would cease to exist. They could barely even look at each other after that graphic moment they both experienced. After a year and a half, once Julia turned 18, Stephen eventually sent her right back home after a year of living with him and gave up his guardianship because he was so traumatized by the whole thing. But our relationship was never the same from the, those days forward. It was about a year before I returned home, but we could hardly look at one another without thinking about that horrific abortion. As time went on, Julia attempted to move on and forget about everything. But of course, as we all know, the older you get, the more you have to face your demons and your trauma. As time went on, Julia then started to put things together and she started to realize that she witnessed a young woman's worst nightmare, grooming. Steven Tyler eventually kept it moving and he decided to move on with his life. And then two years later, he began dating the 26-year-old model, Sarinda Fox and they literally had kids two years later. Steven Tyler went on to appear in many movies, television shows, and even garnered multiple brand deals despite his heinous actions against a teenage girl. As time went on, Julia eventually got involved with a youth group and decided to surrender her entire life to Jesus Christ and the Roman Catholic religion. She is now an activist and she's been married for over 40 years. Now I know a lot of y'all are thinking, a lot of y'all would think that this story would be over after all that trauma that she went through 40 years ago, but of course, the story doesn't end here. In 2003, Steven Tyler released his very controversial book, Walk This Way, and initially, it included many bits and pieces of his life and how he grew to become who he is today. According to Julia, he made some very heinous and exaggerated statements. Julia did stay silent because she figured, since her name was kept anonymous, she might as well ignore it and act like it never happened. But of course, 2003 was just the start of it. It wasn't until 2011, when Steven Tyler was announced as the new judge for American Idol, that Julia's name started to come back up after 30 years. Steven Tyler released his second ever book titled, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You? The book was a breakdown about his mental health, drug abuse, and how fatherhood changed his life. The book was released on New Year's of 2012 and was released as a way to reintroduce himself to a new generation of fans who followed him from American Idol. Steven Tyler briefly spoke about how his relationship with Julia played a role in who he is today, but he stupidly used her name in the books and included her in the credits at the back of the book. And all I, I don't know why he would have done that. I had left him in peace thinking yeah. he'll leave me in peace. I've I've com I never contacted him or asked him for things. And I just let him alone yeah. thinking, surely if I leave him alone, he'll let me be. And I can just live my life with this new world that I've built for myself with my family, my children and my husband. And, you know, it was devastating. That Star Magazine came out. I was on my way to a, a school gala fundraiser for my kids. I stopped at the grocery store to get money for the valet parking at this event that, and there's the star magazine article and I'm in it and I'm on my way thinking, Oh my goodness, you know, are my kids going to see this? Are they going to recognize that that's their mother? And you know, my oldest son, he saw it online and he ended up calling my husband and saying, dad, there's a picture of mom in the tabloids and we need to have we have to sit down and talk to the, you know, my younger brothers and about this because they don't, I don't want them. I, I they should not have found out about it through mm. the tabloids. Mm. I should have told them about it beforehand, but I was trying to protect them. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, I don't want them to be touched by this ordeal that I went through by the traumas of my youth. Mm. I want to protect them from it. So I had not told them. It wasn't something I was proud of. I didn't want to brag about it, that's for sure, because it was something I was ashamed of. It had been a degrading uh, period of my life. It was a very demeaning experience to live through those things, and I didn't want them to know about it. Stephen Tyler made numerous claims about Julia. He claimed that Julia had multiple abortions, and he also claimed that Julia was very sexually active, and they would oftentimes do salacious acts in public. Stephen Tyler also claimed in his book that after he sent her home to go back with her mom, he apparently called off the wedding and she wanted money on her way out. Julia was then fed up and quickly ran to the media to clear her name and called out Steven Tyler for being a pedophile and grooming her when she was a teenage girl. Julia was heavily suppressed by the media and many media outlets refused to give her a platform to tell her story. The only places that Julia was able to tell her story were on underground media outlets and they gave her a shine of light but she didn't get that much light. 
So a lot of people never really peeped her. And it's funny because Steven Tyler had just been on top of the world all over again because he had just been announced as a judge on American Idol. So you would think that the entire world would have a microscope on Steven Tyler considering he's the new judge on American Idol. You would think that the major media outlets would pick this up. But of course, many media outlets acted like they didn't even see these things. As of now, Julia is a pro-life right-wing activist and she actively travels the world speaking to young girls about her life as a former rock star girlfriend and her struggles with PTSD after her very graphic abortion. She is now heavily pro-life and she does everything she can to make sure that Roe v. Wade gets overturned after her traumatic experience. Now as for Steven Tyler, he's still for some reason to this day praised in the entertainment industry. Shockingly enough, Steven even won an Emmy Award the same year Julia spoke out against him and he was also honored for his voice acting on The Wonder Pets. He also appeared in many shows after that like Lizzie McGuire, SNL, and even Two and a Half Men and shows like Nashville. Hollywood refuses to hold Steven Tyler accountable and I think it's all absolutely disgusting how at 72 years old he's still working in the entertainment industry and people have yet to condemn him for his problematic actions. But for some reason society always puts a microscope on the fucked up shit that Bill Cosby did back in the 1700s and all the problematic things Michael Jackson allegedly did back in the 90s. Isn't that interesting how we still talk about some of the shit Bill Cosby did and some of the stuff Michael Jackson did? But we never talk about the stuff Steven Tyler did, and the man is damn near 70, 72 years old. He's damn near close to Bill Cosby's age. But it just goes to show you that as long as you do what the elitists say, they'll protect you at all costs. Because it's very odd how Steven Tyler has not gotten his Me Too movement. Now, fast forward all the way to 2021, Steven Tyler now owns a major facility that he opened up in Atlanta back in 2017 called Janie's Fund. The name Janie's Fund was inspired by the Aerosmith song, Janie's Got a Gun. And the Janie facility is a widely respected facility that houses hundreds of young girls who have been neglected, abused, and ran away from home for a better life. He literally owns a facility where he protects young, abused, and neglected girls. Yeah. I guess the only question that I have is, why hasn't he been held accountable? And why did the media do everything they could to protect his image once he appeared on American Idol? Why did he win an Emmy the same year his victim spoke out? Why did he still get to stay on American Idol? And why did this man still get to open a facility despite what he did to this 16 year old girl back in the 1970s? Now, of course, I don't want to just say that it's the race card that protects Steven Tyler. All I will say is the dark forces of the industry definitely does not see color. Considering there are plenty of entertainers who haven't been held accountable, well, at least yet. I can say that there's plenty of entertainers of all different races who of course never been held accountable. And I think it all depends on what you do for the elitists or what you do for the powerful people or the higher ups or whatever you want to call it. I think it depends on if you do their bidding and you do exactly what they say, they'll protect you at all costs. I mean, look at Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby decided to rebel against the higher ups and out of nowhere, here comes stuff from 1969, 1954, 1983, 1975 resurfacing and catching up to him. Michael Jackson decides to rebel. Every 10 years, every 5 years, you hear these new allegations resurfacing all over again. Let's be honest here. A lot of these grown-ass men know how old a lot of these young girls are. Honestly, the Me Too movement genuinely started with good intentions. And it's unfortunate how ugly the media has turned it into. The media has turned it into something so ugly, so polluted, and so corrupt as a way to target celebrities of their choice. There's so many celebrities who have done problematic things, but it's funny how the Me Too movement only holds certain celebrities accountable. You never see all the other celebrities being held accountable for their association with these people, but it's always interesting how a lot of these other celebrities are always protected by the media. I also find it funny how I see people like Oprah and Kale interviewing victims and trying to dig up the paths of several entertainers who are no longer with us, but it's funny how they would never call out their own damn friends. Because karma may be a bitch, but let's be very real. Karma is a bitch, but karma definitely will take her sweet time. But that's all for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys for all the support on my channel. Thank you guys for all the support you guys gave me on my Trey Songs video. I'm very shocked at all the support that I got. And if you guys want to see more celebrities that seem to always get away with fuck shit, people should just comment them down below. If you guys want to see one on Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Will Smith, or any other celebrity who has done problematic things in the entertainment industry, rather it's abuse, blackballing, doing horrible things, please be sure to leave them down below, comment down below, and I will be sure to get to them. So yeah, like, comment, subscribe, protect your damn kids, protect your damn kids, and protect your damn kids. The music industry is evil, and yeah, like, comment, and subscribe. Choice out this bitch. Love you now. Love you now. Sometimes
Let it